Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paul Lucas. I'm the Queensland President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, and welcome to tonight's webinar. We're delighted tonight to have Dr. Carl Ungra, who is a lecturer in international relations at the University of Notre Dame, to talk to us on the very interesting subject of does Queensland need a foreign policy? Uh, and uh, can I say, as someone who was involved with the Queensland government for quite a few years, uh, I'm very, very interested uh, in the subject matter of tonight's, uh, tonight's talk. Before I hand over to Carlo, can I tell you a little bit about him? Uh, as I said, um, he is a lecturer in international relations at the University of Notre Dame. He is a former diplomat, intelligence analyst and policy advisor. Between 2014 to 18, he was head of the Leadership Crisis and Conflict Management Program at the Geneva Centre for Policy, Security in Switzerland. His most recent handbook is a handbook of terrorism and counterterrorism post 9-11, edited with David Martin Jones, Paul Schult, and MLR Smith, and published by Edward Elgar in the United Kingdom. So I'll, um, and uh, just a little bit um, about the, um, the his subject, uh, his subject matter tonight. Uh, I'll just tell you a little bit about it. Uh, the states and territories are now frontline actors in responding to the global trade and economic challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And despite the early unity of the national cabinet, state premiers are increasingly acting on their own to build, rebuild economies and jobs. But when the Commonwealth government's foreign policy is at odds with the interests of individual states and territories, who wins? At the same time, China has become more adroit at navigating the federal system to pursue its own interests. So does Queensland need a foreign policy? And if so, how would that work? So Carl, welcome tonight and over to you. Well, thank you so much, Paul, and uh, to David Costello, to Lily, the executive team at the AAA, all my friends who are there online, I hope tonight, uh, Thank you so much for the invitation to have me back and to have a talk at the AAA. I think it's been a, over a year since I've, I've given a, a talk to one of the branches. So it's really lovely to be back engaged with the Institute, which I've been involved with for over 25 years. So it's uh, one, of those, I, 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 one of those great institutions in Australia. Uh, it's a bit of a sign of the times, isn't it, that we're meeting online tonight rather than in person. Um, and so uh, this uh, zeitgeist is one of lots of Zoom meetings and post-COVID recovery, uniting and recovering from this global pandemic. And I'm going to say a bit more about the implications of COVID-19 for us a bit further down the track. But hopefully it's not too much longer until we get to meet in person. Um, so the plan is that I'm going to talk for the next 30 or 40 minutes, throw some ideas on the table. The title of our talk tonight, Does Queensland Need a Foreign Policy, is a little bit provocative, so hopefully it provokes a bit of interest and debate, and I'm really looking forward to getting some feedback and thoughts and questions you might have about this subject. Um, but I'm, you know, tonight, uh, Maurice Payne probably heard that we were doing this, and she's scheduled a foreign policy talk of her own with Rory Medcalf down at the ANU. So we're competing with her tonight. So I, 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 I forgive you if some of you jump in and out, and, uh, but I promise you that this talk is going to be far more interesting, hopefully. Um, since I first uh, been started thinking about these ideas, I, um, about uh, states and foreign policy, I, 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 I had a number of conversations with AAA members and academics and others, and it's been really interesting getting some of that feedback and thoughts that are around the country uh, about this idea. And in particular, if Andrew Carr and Frank Yorn are online tonight, both old friends of mine, I'd, I'd really welcome their contributions to this debate because I think both of them have some particularly interesting insights into this whole question. So Andrew and Frank, if you're there, hi, and join in any time, please. So the question tonight is, does Queensland need a foreign policy? And for my conservative friends in the think tank world, there's a very short and a very simple answer to this question, and it's simply no. 
Um, for people like Michael Shoebridge or Peter Jennings at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, they would say that the traditional view is that foreign policy is conducted by the federal government exercising its authority under the external affairs powers of the constitution. And that's the end of the story. But as Andrew Carr and others have been writing about recently, uh, the story is just not that simple. And in the face of this global pandemic that we're all facing, which has decimated our economies, has ignited these trade tensions, both between and inside states, the question, I think, deserves a little bit more study. For me, the question raises three important issues. First, it's around the changing conduct of Australian diplomacy. The second issue is about the rights of states versus the Commonwealth under the Constitution. And the third issue I want to address tonight is the future of international relations. So these are quite big picture issues we're going to be talking about tonight. And I hope, uh, I hope it provokes, as I said, it provokes a bit of debate. So I want to touch on each of those issues quite briefly and, and get some responses and some ideas generated. So for me, the story begins in 2012 because it was in March that year that Prime Minister Julia Gillard appoints a former New South Wales Premier, Bob Carr, as the Minister for Foreign Affairs and parachutes him into the Senate. And I was watching these events uh, with, with some interest, I have to say, uh, from the trenches of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute where I was working. A couple of days later, Stephen Loosely, the former New South Wales Senator, he rings me up and he says, I should go in and join Bob's office as his senior foreign policy advisor. And the interview's tomorrow. I went, okay. Uh, so I go down to Bob's office in Bly Street in Sydney and, uh, and, and uh, turn up for an interview. And the, you go into this palatial office that Bob has there opposite the Lowy Institute and the rooms filled from floor to ceiling with books, as you'd expect. Bob invites me in and he says in that baritone voice, he says, what do you think of China? And I paused for a moment and I thought, that's a good question for an incoming foreign minister. Because since around 2009, China had been our largest trading partner. The Obama administration in the United States had announced its Asian pivot strategy. And clearly, Australia's economic and strategic interests were tied up in the triangular relationship between the United States, China, and ourselves. So, um, uh, and on top of that, of course, the Gillard government that year was to publish its uh, Asian Century White Paper, which was meant to be a strategy for how Australia was going to deal with and engage with the region for the decades to come. So my answer to Bob in this question was this. I said, first, it's the right question to ask. Uh, and secondly, I said, Australia continues and will continue to get our China policy wrong when we overestimate China's power, but we underestimate its influence. And we need to do much more diplomatically to shape how China influences the region, and we should be worrying far less about Hugh White's esoteric and military-focused China choice thesis, which had just come out at about the same time. Because I think we do have a choice to make, but that choice is not between Beijing and Washington. Our choice will be between the exercise of a very creative, and effective middle power diplomacy to advance our interests in a more contested and difficult international order, choice between that or policy paralysis or nothing. And then I thought, well, 2012 was crucial in some other ways as well. It was in 2012 that China became the number one source of 
tourists and foreign students into Australia. A few years before that, as I said, in 2009, China had overtaken Japan as our number one trading partner. Today, China accounts for around $130 billion Australian in annual exports. And the vast bulk of that, of course, is in the resources sector, in iron ore, in coal and gas. That same year, 2012, again, uh, Xi Jinping took over as head of the Chinese Communist Party from Hu Jintao, and he would promise he promised to deliver on this um, this idea of a China dream, sort of taking the idea of the American dream and applying it with Chinese characteristics. In Queensland itself, 2012 was a pretty cathartic year. Paul Lucas might have more to say about that. Um, the AL P, the government suffered its worst electoral defeat in Queensland history, reduced to just seven seats in the parliament. But it's interesting to remember that Anna Bly, Premier Anna Bly, took to the 2012 election a promise to fund 1,000 scholarships for Queensland students to study in the Asia Pacific region. And that was long before Julie Bishop had introduced the idea of a new Colombo plan at the federal level. The idea of scholarships to Asia got swept away by Candu Campbell and the rest we now know as history. So my argument here is that 2012 marked an important pivotal moment in our diplomatic history. We had really at that moment to take stock of the fundamental shifts in the international order to reorient our foreign policy, or we could abandon all of that to three letter slogans. Unfortunately, we chose the latter. Tony Abbott became the prime minister in October, 2013, of course, declaring that Australian foreign policy would be, and I quote, less Geneva and more Jakarta. Um, so with that, I decided to leave Australia and get a job in Geneva where I spent the following four years. The period also marked the moment when the federal government had abandoned any pretense to the idea that diplomacy and development assistance mattered that much. So DFAT funding has reached a historic low of just 1.3% of the federal budget. And the Australian aid budget, as many of you will know, went from a commitment to reach 0.5% of GNI, of gross national income, in 2013, to where it is today at just 0.19%. And if you put that into perspective a little bit, our combined diplomacy, development and trade budget in 1949 was 9% of the Commonwealth budget. So this Diplomatic deficit, as the Lowy Institute calls it, has severely curtailed our ability, the ability of the federal government at least, to prosecute Australia's foreign policy interests. But money's just one side of this story. The trend over time, I think, has also been to delegitimize the role of diplomacy in our national politics. So we've reached the point today where all of our major diplomatic posts overseas, except Beijing and Jakarta, are headed by political appointees. So London, Washington, New Delhi, Tokyo, New York, Wellington, are all of them are headed by political appointments. And I'm not opposed to sending additional ex politicians overseas as an ambassador. Kim Beasley made a very good ambassador in Washington. But the scale of this current politicization of our diplomacy is unprecedented in our history. So for these last seven or eight years, as the geopolitics and geoeconomics of our region have shifted quite quickly, we have defunded devalued the very tools we needed to deal with these international changes. And as the saying goes, nature abhors a vacuum. 
So it's not surprising that in the last few years, states and territories have started to assert their own interests and pursue their own international relations uh, in the absence of federal leadership. I guess the most famous example of this is of course the memorandum of understanding that the Victorian government signed with China in 2018 on what's called the Belt and Road Initiative, which is China's ambitious and I think unachievable goal, nonetheless, of linking Asia, Africa and Europe through both land and sea infrastructure corridors. And I want to come back to the Belt and Road Initiative uh, later. So Andrews, the Andrews government in Victoria showed that conducting diplomacy outside the Canberra bubble is more common than many people think. The states and territories have built an impressive international network of trade promotion and investment offices around the world. Queensland, for example, has six offices of its own in China. State premiers often conduct overseas visits to showcase investment opportunities, and then sometimes even get caught in bidding wars with the other states, and sometimes even with the federal government itself over the location of these investment projects. So diplomacy is no longer the sole prerogative of the federal government, if it ever was. Many of you will know that for many years after Federation, that Queensland had appointed an agent general in London, and that was only meant to be a direct line of reporting through the state governor to the Crown. And then this brings us to our second point. What does the constitution itself say about states and foreign policy? Again, it's not a simple story. So Mary Crook and other academics have shown that the external affairs power under the Constitution, Section 51 of the Constitution, is vague and incomplete. As far as I can tell, that vagueness was a deliberate ploy of the states during the Federation debates of the 1880s and 1890s. They wanted some constitutional ambiguity on the external affairs powers of the Commonwealth in order to retain their sovereign capacity for themselves. Indeed, for the first 50 years after Federation, successive Commonwealth governments in Canberra didn't really seek to exercise an independent foreign policy. As Alan Gingell has noted, the title that was given to Australia's early diplomatic establishment, exter the Department of External Affairs, was very important. Foreign policy, as opposed to foreign policy, which is the crafting of specific proposals, actions, and negotiations with other countries, that foreign policy was direct Britain's responsibility. And as a member of the empire, the only relationship, the only international relationship that mattered for Australia was with London, and there was nothing foreign about the United Kingdom in the first few decades after Federation. So as a dominion, Canberra then seemed content to outsource its foreign policy to the empire. Australians carried British passports. Um, we, we had only one overseas diplomatic mission in the UK for a long time until around the time of the war when things started opening up. But this was really a sort of antipodean obsequiousness, if you like. And that would continue to underwrite Australian foreign policy for decades. So by the time the 1950s rolled around, and without a hint of irony, Richard, later Lord Casey, the Australian foreign minister during the Menzies era, calmly told the media that, and I quote, our foreign policy being moulded on that of Great Britain and arrived at in consultation with her is the best we can achieve. And that was pretty much the best that we did achieve for nearly half a century, I think. 
on several occasions, the states have even challenged the right of the Commonwealth to sign international treaties where states' rights are engaged. Famously, and in a case that doesn't hold Queensland politics in a very favourable light, unfortunately, was the challenge by the then Bjorka Peterson government to Australia signing on to the UN Human Rights Convention on the elimination of all forms of racial discrimination. The Bjorka Peterson government opposed this because it would create land rights to indig for Indigenous Australians. Thankfully, the Queensland government under Bjorka Peterson lost that case in the High Court. But it did show that the external affairs power remained ambiguous in the constitution and could be challenged. As the number of issues confronting policymakers in the field of international affairs has continued to grow from international education to oceans and climate change, the balance between the constitutional powers of the states and the Commonwealth is again under scrutiny. And so this brings me to my final point. Queensland and Australia face an international order that is changing very quickly and one that requires, I think, some deeper thinking about how we're going to navigate the future. Donald Horn had the famous line in The Lucky Country about a second-rate people who have shared Australia's luck. And I think that's a slightly unfair characterization for an entire population. But there is something to the idea that we have been lazy about our recent economic prosperity. The rise of China has offered an easy pathway for our miners, our tourism operators, and our universities, including those in Brisbane, to exploit without having to do much work. I don't necessarily blame them, it was easy money. And I think they've been let down by a political class that for the past decade, failed to diversify our exports away from just one country. We were always going to rely on China becoming what Bob Zellick, the US State Department official had wanted China to become, and that was a responsible stakeholder in the international system. The hope was that they would socialize to the international order and become more responsible players. That hasn't happened. And as Hillary Clinton once said, hope is not a strategy. So now that China has begun to tighten the economic screws on Australia, the government is scrambling to find an answer. And when the Chinese government won't even pick up the phone to our trade minister during the most difficult economic downturn in 100 years, I think it's time for a new strategy. Queensland's three biggest exports are in mining, in the resources sector, in tourism, and in education. But when all our eggs are in the one basket and they're all rotten, we should think about getting some new chooks. So what would a Queensland foreign policy look like? For me, I think it would begin by recognizing that Queensland has some major assets that the rest of the world wants. If we were a country, we would be around the same size as New Zealand, a Singapore or a Denmark. And as those small states have shown, that if they calibrate their international strategy carefully, if they are selective about the issues that they pursue, and if they work in concert with others in a multilateral setting, they can often achieve good outcomes on the international stage. So Queensland should be looking to diversify our export markets, work with other countries who more closely share our values. And you look around the region, Japan, India, Indonesia, and even Vietnam are large and emerging markets in our region. Taiwan is a growing market that has been severely underserved for a long time. And aside from trade, the range of issues on which Queensland could play a useful role are varied. 
despite all the nice rhetoric about Australia having a Pacific step up, Queensland, I think, is best placed to engage more fully with the Pacific Island states, particularly PNG, with which we share a border. As the custodian of the Great Barrier Reef, Queensland should be leading international debates about ocean acidification, coral bleaching, and more broadly about climate change. Indeed, some of the states in the United States of America have already ventured further down this path. So today, California itself is a leading player in the international climate change negotiations. And the Victorian government has shown there's no particular impediment to signing international agreements that seek to grow state economies and to enhance international linkages. And while I do not advocate that Queensland should sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative, the precedent is there to seek out new partnerships, negotiate new agreements, and to grow the state economy. So if I sum up my argument tonight, it's this. I began by noting that Australian diplomacy was changing and they're not changing for the better. In fact, it'd been, we have a smaller, less capable, less well-funded diplomatic corps in Canberra than at any time since the 1960s. At the very same time, the challenges for Australia are growing exponentially. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated a lot of the trends that were occurring in the geopolitical order, and they will have a direct consequence on the form and the conduct of Australian foreign policy. Second, I noted that the argument that only the federal government can do international relations is not consistent with the constitution, and there is a great deal of wriggle room in our federal system for multiple lines of endeavor of endeavor on foreign policy activity. And finally, we noted that the changing international order compels states such as Queensland, it's going to have to pursue its interests in more novel and creative ways. So the question we started with was, does Queensland need a foreign policy? My answer to that question is yes. And I think we need one fast. Thanks very much, Paul. Thanks very much, Carl. And uh, we've got a number of questions here, but uh, I might um, I might take the prerogative of um, of, of, of the chair uh, first. Uh, can I say to you that uh, one of the things that I've noticed as being involved in the federal system in Australia is that Many Australians don't understand the three tiers of government, and most countries in the world are not federal um, uh, governments, uh, they're, uh, or federal systems, they're um, uh, unitary systems. Um, how, uh, in your experience, uh, and of course you've got Swiss experience, and we know Germany and of course the United States as well as Australia, how is your experience in terms of the perception of overseas countries and their understanding of the differences in interests between uh, national governments and uh, uh, provincial or state governments? Yeah, thanks, Paul. It's a good question, isn't it? Because several of our close partners, as you said, are also federal systems. You think of the, the Canadians, the Germans, the Swiss, the Americans, all have federal systems. Um, and I think countries that we deal with overseas are becoming much more attuned to the nuances of federal systems and how to navigate their way around it. I think there's no doubt that the Victoria-China relationship was as a direct result of the Chinese government identifying the Victorians as being an early mover on some of these big infrastructure deals and therefore probably a useful point of entry into Australia in that regard when the federal government, even though a year before Victoria signed its memoranda with um, China, the federal government had also signed a, uh, an agreement, although the text of that we've, we've never seen publicly, but nonetheless, there's a sort of a broad 
uh, agreement between at the federal level and now China and at the state level. I think countries are more attuned to these federal systems. Some are stronger than others. So the German system gives far more weight and power to the states than I think most other federal systems. And so dealing with Germany is as much about dealing with the, the various um, regions as it is about dealing with the central government uh, in Bonn so, or Berlin. So it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? And I think it's, uh, I just think it's a more sophisticated landscape in which diplomacy occurs. I, I'm also reminded that, you know, we've, we've had the exponential growth in these sister city relationships, over, particularly over the last, say, 20 years. And um, some cities themselves have their own strategic personality. I mean, cities as large as Tokyo, 20 million people, it's almost the same size as all of Australia. Um, big cities are having uh, a strategic personality all of their own. And that too is being factored into these debates where um, finding points of influence and pressure is not necessarily, and it's not always the federal government that is the first point of call. Uh, it, it's certainly very interesting that those different personalities, you only have to look at contemporary politics in the United States, that anyone who thinks that that country is a country that speaks with one voice or is all the same, you know, red and blue um, uh, coloured states and the like, the differences between the cities and, and everything that's in between the two coasts, of course, is a classic example. Can I um, pose this question from uh, our member, Tess newton Kane? Uh, given Queensland's geographical, trade, historical, cultural and demographic links with the countries of the Pacific Islands region, how do you see this crucial set of relationships as part of a Queensland foreign policy? For example, you might, link, you might like to address why uh, Trade Investment Queensland has no presence in PNG or any other Pacific country. Um, uh, bearing in mind that generally countries do choose areas of particular strategic comparative advantage for missions and the like. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. And, and, and thanks to Tess for this question, which I hold very deeply in my heart. I, I think I was telling Paul before we came online tonight, I, I did my second diplomatic posting in Fiji and I, uh, I, I have a very, I have a very soft spot for the Pacific Islands as a, one probably the most important arena for the conduct of uh, our foreign policy, um, both at the state and federal level. So let me go through a little bit uh, about that. I absolutely agree with the point um, that much more effort needs to go uh, from TIQ, the Trade and Investment Queensland and other agencies in forming stronger, deeper relationships with countries like PNG. PNG is now a country of 9 million people uh, growing exponentially, massive resources, potentially will have a large um, uh, middle class in the next few decades, which a very young country, by the way, and will have a real um, appetite for travel to Australia. And we should be in on the ground floor working with countries like PNG to foster those sorts of relationships. Um, in terms of a Queensland foreign policy, I remember, I'm old enough to remember um, the debates that went on um, at the time of the conflict between the Guadalcanese and the Malaitans in, in the Solomon Islands before Ramsey, before the regional assistance mission went ahead in 2003. But in that five year period before that, remember we had a series of negotiations that were all held in Townsville. And the Townsville Accords, which are an, immense, uh, an attempt to provide a peacekeeping framework for the conflict that was bubbling along between various militia groups in the Solomon Islands, became an, a really important part of the diplomacy that was being conducted. Now, uh, admittedly, that was being done at the uh, level of the federal government for the most part. But the fact is Queensland had some very unique insights, having been close to the Pacific Islanders for 200 years, not least of which because of the 
um, Pacific Labor Migration Schemes that had occurred into North Queensland, into the cane fields and elsewhere. So I think there is a real role for countries, for states like Queensland to play. And I think we have some genuine capabilities to negotiate and to act as this sort of um, good, good international citizen, if you like, a Gareth Evans talk uh, in some of these areas, Paul. Thanks, Carl. Uh, next question is from Liam Carter. Is there potential danger in having a state foreign policy that diverges drastically from federal foreign policy? That is, Pacific Step Up allows Queensland and the federal governments to work in tandem uh, Chinese involvement in Queensland technology contracts may not. But perhaps I might add a, 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 another aspect to that. Uh, certainly, there's enormous training in DFAT that goes into statecraft, uh, whereas trade officers uh, or state representations are not trained in that area. Uh, so, is there a question of carving out particular aspects of, of uh, foreign policy that states shouldn't be involved in as well? Hmm. Uh, thanks, Liam. And um, just on the dangers of having radically different uh, uh, foreign policies, I, I mentioned in my talk uh, about California. California on its climate change policy, if, so if California was a country, think about this, uh, if California was a country, it would be the seventh largest country in the world. Um, it, it is a massive economy. It, it, it holds... Uh, several of the top 20 companies in the world by market capitalization. It has an extremely different view of climate change. And that, that, that is a bottom up perspective from the population of California that does not want to follow uh, Trump and that view of the world on climate change. So there are, there can, there, you can accommodate quite radically different views at both the state and federal level. Uh, to Paul's point about state officers, you're absolutely right. TIQ does a very good job, um, and I say that because my wife works at TIQ, but, um, you know, I think uh, there is an argument to say that the skills of tradecraft that are taught at the federal level in DFAT um, are worthy of being translated at the state level as well. The, state, the states simply do not have the institutional capacity right now, because they've just invested in it, um, to do the, to, to have a sort of more independent view. My argument is we need one, and I think the states would, like Queensland, would do well to invest uh, in some of those capabilities quite quickly. Thanks, Carl. Um, the uh, next question is. Um uh, a major is from Ordan Andreevsky. A major problem with states pursuing independent foreign policy is the lack of transparency and accountability, especially in relation to the BRI and in relation to Macedonia, for example, uh, which which he indicates Daniel um, or Ordan indicates Daniel Andrew is incorrectly described as being more Greek than the Acrop than the Acropolis. Uh, I would ask you to respond to that proposition. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, on the Macedonian problem. No, I, look, I, I do agree, Ordan, that there are uh, dangers uh, in this sort of behaviour. On the transparency front, it's, it is quite interesting that the Victorian government has released uh, the text of the memorandum of understanding that it signed with China, and that's available, you can get that off the internet these days. Um, but the Australian government hasn't released the text of its own agreement with the Chinese on BRI. So I'm, I'm all in favour of more transparency in these things. And I think uh, treaties, uh, any, any agreement that a government signs on behalf of its people should be made available to those people. But, um, you know, I think it's a uh, uh, I, I, I agree that transparency is an issue. I, I don't think it's fatal to the conduct of state, a state's foreign policy, uh, because um, at all times there's going to have to be an accommodation between state interests and Commonwealth interests. And 
the truth is, despite the ambiguity under Section 51 of the Constitution, uh, the Commonwealth of Australia is still the only um, authorised entity under the Vienna Convention on Treaties to be able to sign formal treaties with uh, other states. Now, that doesn't mean that Daniel Andrews can't do what he did, which was to sign something of a sub treaty status, a memorandum of understanding, a, a set of agreements uh, with other countries. You can do that. You can't just sign formal treaties that commit uh, yourself to various things. The Macedonia question, Paul, I, I, I think I'll leave for another night. I think that's too fraught with dangers, that one. <laughs> uh, thanks, Carl. Uh, our next question is from our former nationally, National Executive Director of the AIIA, Melissa Conley-Taylor. Um, and it's all, again about BRI. Uh, you said you wouldn't advocate for Queensland to sign on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Why? Um, firstly, can I just say hi, Melissa? Uh, although I can't see you, it's lovely to uh, get something from you, and I hope you're having a fun time down in Melbourne. Um, I can't wait till we catch up again soon. Um, why we shouldn't sign on to the BRI? Um, I am not an advocate of uh, what the BRI is trying to do. I think if you, if you look at uh, what's occurred in countries such as uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, um, Sri Lanka, uh, even Djibouti, that have signed on to aspects of this infrastructure financing from the Chinese, so much of it is um, the, the debt arrangements are quite ambiguous. There's real... There, there are, there are real. There's a great opacity in the, in the actual conduct of some of these things. And I'm not, I'm not of the view, the the Aspie view of the world, the Peter Jennings view of the world that, um, you know, the BRI is just this um, nefarious uh, global soft power or even hard power activity of the Chinese to shore up oil supplies out of Africa or indeed, uh, then the Middle East or um, to lock countries into a tributary relationship with Beijing. I, I, I don't subscribe to that view either, but I just don't think um, the, what, uh, the, the mechanisms that have been put in place um, are necessarily the sorts of things we should be doing. I absolutely agree with the infrastructure step up that uh, the Morrison government has announced for the Pacific Islands and the channeling of some of our now depleted aid to those activities, because that's I think Australia should be leading. Um, and, and the other point I'd make there, Melissa, as well, is that the Japanese uh, have a far stronger presence in infrastructure development in the Pacific Island states currently than the Chinese do. And we should be, we and the Japanese should absolutely, and the New Zealanders should be working collectively uh, to foster some of that activity. So, um, yeah, I, I hope that answers your question and um, it's a beer on me next time I see you. A uh, very interesting question from Saba Senai Mabagani. Uh, given that rural and regional Queensland are significant contributors to trade through mining, tourism, agricultural exports, and to some extent education, and therefore part of any Queensland foreign policy, how do we ensure that this is a conversation that includes regional and rural Queenslanders and are not as seen as a preoccupation of the southeast corner and uh, has broader legitimacy and ownership. Uh, Saba's speaking to us or listening to us from the wonderful central highlands of uh, Queensland, a part that's very dear to me, uh, Emerald. Uh, but it's a valid point, isn't it? Uh, you know, how far do we go? Do we then say, should individual local governments have a foreign policy? Would you care to respond to that rural and regional issue? Thanks, Paul. And thanks, Saba. Thanks, Saba, for the question, which I think is really crucial because when you look at uh, Queensland's trading relationships, as I, as I sort of mentioned before, uh, the resources sector, uh, um, tourism, and then education as being our top three. If you, um, and then down the list, of course, comes beef and, and uh, the ag sector as well, or most of which is in the north or in regional and rural Queensland. Um, they have a vested interest in the kinds of markets we can get our products into. 
And here's where the split between the state and the federal government, I think, has occurred because, because I think we've put so much emphasis and so much triumphalism around the signing of the chapter, the China Australia Free Trade Agreement, that we thought that the Chinese were just simply going to soak up every bit of produce uh, service that we could provide. Um, that's not that's not going to be the case, as we've seen in the last couple of years. And I think this um, this sort of uh, belligerent behaviour we've seen out of Beijing is going to continue. We shouldn't have put all our eggs in that basket. And part of having a foreign policy is very much about having a, a Queensland approach to the pro services and goods that we sell in overseas markets and, and having a, and a more diversified and dispersed uh, trade profile. We should not have put all our eggs in the China basket. We need to quickly orient away from that. Uh, and that's as, that's as much about what, what, what happens in rural and regional Queensland. Um, and, and I think it's, it, it's, it's really important that we do that because, um, you know, you look at somewhere like UQ, which had um, clearly uh, taken itself down the pathway of overseas students, and in particular overseas students from China, to such an extreme that it now finds itself uh, in this COVID lockdown in extreme difficulties because of uh, all eggs in one basket, as I said. And I think that strategy is wrong. The, the strategy needs to shift quite quickly and um, we should be looking at other markets for Queensland. Uh, thanks, Carl. Our next question is from Jeremy Matthew Costa. Will Australia's lack of ambition on climate action affect the ability of Australia's state and territories, like Queensland, on building relationships with Pacific Island states, given their sensitivity to these issues? If so, should Queensland and other states look to improve their own independent climate policy? Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, I, I think uh, you answer your own question in some ways. Uh, and I think you'd be with me in saying that if the federal government, uh, we, we, we've, um, we've fumbled over climate change policy, haven't we, for a decade or more. You only have to read Malcolm Turnbull's latest book. Um, we've fumbled over climate change policy for a long time. Um, Queensland uh, has a vested interest in ensuring that there are as good climate change, because if, if we do see uh, two percent temperature rises. We are going to see the end of the Great Barrier Reef. That is not a good outcome for our tourism operators, for our uh, for our entire economy. So um, we have an extreme vested interest in ensuring there is good climate policy. And if the federal government won't step in, state governments need to. And I think we're already seeing this. Uh, and and indeed, you know, the, to be fair, the Palaszczuk government in terms of investment in renewable resources has been at the forefront of what the states have been doing. And I think uh, they, they understand that a climate change policy is an issue at the state level, particularly when we have a policy vacuum at the federal level. Um, clearly, as you rightly point out, the climate change issue is perhaps the most important international issue for most of the Pacific Island states who face sea level rises you only have to go to places like Tuvalu and, and Nauru to understand that this is an existential threat to these countries. And if we are not, as both a country and indeed as a state, at the forefront of some of these, these debates, we are going to pay dearly in our relationships. Uh, thanks very much uh, for that question, uh, Jeremy. Uh, next question is back to another one from Melissa Conley-Tyler. And it really relates, I think, to the point that you just made, um, uh, Carl, in terms of underinvestment, uh, and, and uh, Melissa states, I couldn't agree more on the problem with the underfunding of Australia's diplomacy. AsiaLink research last year showed the funding of Australia's diplomacy, development and trade is now at its lowest level ever. Do you think the Commonwealth Government draws the link between this underinvestment and what it would see as state government adventurism on foreign policy? Or perhaps I could put that a different way. Um, how can I complain about the states spending more money on foreign policy if they're not putting it in themselves? Absolutely right, uh, Melissa. And, and I think most people know that Melissa has been at the forefront of this debate uh, for quite a while um, uh, in, in, in sort of really documenting just that the, the 
abdication of responsibility for funding our foreign policy, particularly as we've had exponential increases in defence funding for submarines that look quite expensive at the moment. Uh, but I'll leave that to one side. Um, look, I think uh, if uh, that surely the federal government, uh, as I said, if it, if it if it simply abdicates the the policy space, it cannot expect the states to just not take up some of that vacuum. It's uh, they will states will pursue their interests uh, if the Commonwealth fails to do so for them. And I think states are waking up to this. The Victorian government probably more so and in not, not always in and sometimes in clumsy ways, but more so than than others. But the other states, Mark McGowan over in WA uh, has been adamant that, you know, the, the West Australian Strait needs to do something more ab uh, about its relationship with China, given its uh, resource profile and particularly uh, the extractive industries and, and the sale to China, and they need to diversify their own markets as well. But the states are waking up to this. And, and I think uh, we're at this kind of interesting pivot moment, aren't we, in our history, where we're going to have to be more clever about uh, how uh, that relationship between Commonwealth and state operates. So uh, I couldn't agree with you more, Melissa. Oh, my next question is from Holly E. Uh, but before I read her question, I might perhaps preface it. One of the real challenges when you're in government is the very, between the two ends of the one spectrum, the importance of uniformity, common rules, easy to understand, same rules that apply wherever you are in a state or country, Uniform Building Act, for example, on the one hand, and on the other hand, well, uniformity sometimes can stifle innovation. So mm -hmm. what state region council will be at the forefront of say climate policy or whatever, if you require them to be uniform. So Holly's question perhaps um, really asked, develops that point a bit, I think. Uh, hi, Carl, do you think that there may be become a disparity in diplomatic power and interests among states and territories within Australia if there is a lack of coordination of foreign policy by the Commonwealth? Um, well, thank you uh, to uh, my wonderful former student, Holly Edwards, for that question. That is, uh, 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 you know, demonstrating uh, what a brilliant young person you are and a future leader of this country. So uh, glad to hear you're online and engaged. Um, disparity of power between the states as, as sort of leading to um, some confusion. I, I think, um, like countries have national national interests, states have state interests, and those interests are always determined by a whole range of factors. Holly, we would have talked about it in our international relations courses at, at Bond University. You know, it's um, you know it's it's about geography, it's about uh, demographics, it's about where your population is, it's about um, you know what your security profile looks like, it's about uh, what your economic uh, relationships are like. All of those factors lead you to identifying both national and at the provincial level at state, at state interests. And those are the interests that you need to safeguard. So they're gonna be different in different jurisdictions in a country as big as Australia. You know, just like the Californians have a different view from Washington, um, WA has a different view from Queensland. And that's a function of you know, much smaller population, larger resource base, all those sorts of things. So, that, you know, I, I, do, I don't think that disparity of power necessarily is going to be the constraining factor in, the, in states taking up more of the slack, but I do think it's going to, um, you know, there is going to be some creative tension with the, with the federal government as the states do this sort of thing. My next question, uh, thanks very much for that one, Carl. My next question is from Yuan Zhang. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll preface it perhaps by this. We have certainly seen the United States articulate uh, and in some cases actually act on a punitive uh, uh, actions against governments that he, it has disagreed with uh, in relation to uh, actions concerning, for example, China and some other countries. Yuan Zhang asks, uh, don't you think the Victorian decision of being part of BRI 
may ruin Canberra's China foreign policy and American-Australian relations. And I would add, and what might be the consequence for that uh, to, uh, to Victoria or indeed Australia? Um, uh, thanks, thanks for the question, Yuan. I, um, I think ruin is a tough word. Uh, I don't see Victorians signing on to BRI as uh, ruining our relationship uh, with either the Americans uh, or indeed um, sort of complicating uh, Australian broader foreign policy if the Australian government were to pursue its interests in ways that we want them to. Um, because this agreement, as I said, is at the sub-treaty level. It's a memorandum of understanding. It's not a formal treaty alliance arrangement. So there's, no, there's nothing legally or uh, in practice that would, um, you know, uh, constrain Australia doing other things. It simply commits uh, Victoria to working with China on these big infrastructure projects uh, where there is mutual benefit to do so. Um, Daniel Andrews has said that it has, um, it has delivered more jobs, it's delivered more infrastructure spend in Victoria, and that's what he is focused on. And of course, that's what every state premier is focused on. They want jobs, they want investment, uh, and um, they, will, they will pursue those interests regardless, I think, and sometimes um, in, irrespective of uh, what Canberra does. Uh, the last question uh, uh, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll ask, uh, because it's an absolute cracker, I think, uh, from again from Ordan Andreevsky. Uh, Carl, the Nash, and, and we'll just about wind up, and I've got a little commercial at the end, so don't go away, everybody. Uh, Carl, the national cabinet model has proven successful in, in tackling the COVID 19 pandemic. Should it be used as a platform for formulating coherent foreign policy and building up diplomatic capacity and impact? Thanks, thanks, Ordan. I, I agree with Paul, that is a cracker of a question. And I was quite uh, pleased at the early period of the National Cabinet uh, and the unity of purpose and action that seemed to uh, be occurring there. Unfortunately, it's not really a cabinet in the same sense. It doesn't have a collective decision-making responsibility for the whole country. It's just a sort of a like COAG, it's a sort of a beefed up COAG where you have um, sort of coordination of policy rather than decision making of policy, which is what a cabinet really should be. Um, I, I, I mean, the, the idea is appealing at one level. If you really did have a national cabinet made up of the federal government plus the state premiers and territory leaders uh, and who had uh, came to the table and made actual decisions on things rather than just communicating ones back to their various jurisdictions. Uh, the, the idea is appealing. I just, we've already seen the cracks in the national cabinet appear as it's become highly politicized. And, you know, some states barking at other states over border issues and a whole range of other things. So, um, the, you know, the cracks appeared far too early for me to think that uh, this was going to be a useful long-term mechanism. Well, Thank you, Carl, for, uh, on behalf of the Queensland branch of the AIIA for an excellent, as usual, contribution tonight. And thank you to our audience for some really good questions as well. Um, it, it again has been a pleasure to have you all online. You'd be pleased to know that we're working towards, however, because we are social beings as humans, uh, getting back to a, um, uh, back to a, uh, a, a, in the flesh presence. Uh, but augmented perhaps with webinars on a number of occasions. I should have just get you, Carl, if you wanted to draw anyone's attention to your latest book, where uh, if uh, our watchers or viewers might get hold of that, where's the, place, the best website to, to purchase it from? There it is. <laughs> Thanks, John. Anyone who wants to buy the Global Handbook on Terrorism and Counterterrorism uh, since 9-11, uh, we'll need to spend about £400 and you can only get it from London. And I think about two libraries in the world have actually bought it. I think I own one of uh, only three copies in Australia. So uh, I, I'm not expecting anyone to go out and buy it anytime soon. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, look at it through your library. Uh, 
Finally, everybody, though, uh, just to let you know of our uh, of our next and highly relevant uh, webinar, which will be on Tuesday, the 7th of July, at the same time, 6 o'clock, uh, Air Vice Marshal retired John Blackburn will be speaking about Australia's national resilience. Uh, John is an expert in talking about supply chains. One of the things that we know, not only with COVID-19, but also perhaps with uh, increasing instability in Southeast Asia, the potential of either interdiction of our supply lines or alternatively, merely a pandemic causing interruption to them. Uh, and we've uh, seen a lot of discussion, particularly from John, uh, about uh, interruption to manufacturing supply chains, interruption to oil supply chains, interruption to pharmaceutical supply chains. Fortunately, we make our own toilet paper in Australia, so it's not a problem there and food is pretty good. But there are so many areas where do we actually need to say, right, we might be able to get something cheaper uh, from overseas, but it's a national interest so strong that we need to uh, actually make sure that we are protecting that. We've seen a number of oil refineries in Australia, for example, close. Uh, so that is on Tuesday, the 7th of July. You can subscribe to that uh, through our website uh, at the AAA Queensland branch. So again, thank you everybody for attending tonight. We do hope you've enjoyed it. I certainly have, and we'll see you all soon. Thanks very much, Carl. Thanks everyone. And can I just shout out to all my friends out there in the, the, uh, the, the Zoom land. Uh, thanks for your questions. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. I hope to catch up, as I said, with, uh, with all of you in person soon.